uh, interglock increment, I think. And that's uh, quite good. It's perfectly valid, but it's not uh, very fast. <coughs> and what happens here is that for each implement some very complicated data wrapping mechanism, which packetizes this input stuff. So if you have a for each with number range from one to hundred and two threads. Uh, whoa, what happened here? Oh, I don't know. I'll fix it later. You can see it, yes, still. Uh, that's what I said. For loop from one to hundred with two threads, for example, with two tasks. Uh, first one will get in one package, numbers 1 and 50. And we'll do all processing from 1 to 50. The second will get in another package, range 51 to 100. And we'll do its own processing. If you pass it a string list, uh, this loop, internal loop in the for each code, will get, first time it will get, I think, one value from this string list. So all the threads will spin up as fast as possible. Next time it will get four values. Next time it will get nine and it will get exponentially raised to some predefined value where it will stop. So when you are accessing something that cannot be accessed from multiple threads like this string list, this will take care of flocking, but it will give back to all those threads as much data as possible at the same time. But so there's no much uh, performance hit from this locking. But then there's another problem. Uh, you pass date, those ranges or those packets with data to threads, and one of them completes the work and others are still busy. So again, your CPU is not used. Well, in this case, the, this thread will steal some work from other threads. So it, I say it's quite complicated. <laughs> And again, it will try to use all of your CPU cores as busy as possible until everything is processed while minimizing the <coughs> performance hits because you, you are accessing a shared resource, string list, object list, whatever. And then again, uh, because this uh, is executing in parallel, you don't know in what order the result will be generated. So sometimes this matter. And when this matters, uh, you can, this is purely optional, uh, <coughs> set up the for each so the results are going into an output queue, which is again I omni blocking collection as usual. And in this case, you can again optionally instruct for each to order results back into the order the original data was in. I will show this. The only downside to this, to this last option is that in this case, uh, there's no work stealing. So if a thread runs out of work, it runs out of work. Something had to be given to, so I could implement it. <coughs> uh, so let me, I think this is the, yes, the reason for my yellow picture. What I have here is <coughs> highly intelligent task that checks numbers from one to, what's that, 10 millions and run the, runs this is prime function, which is intentionally written so that it's very slow for demo. And then outputs all primes into some output queue and then logs down here, logs first thousand numbers from this queue. As this is a sequential code, I could simply call uh, list.items.add inside here, but I wanted to have the similar code that to the code that we'll use in the parallel version. 
I wanted the two codes to be as much similar to one to another so we can compare results and timings and so on. So if I run this, do I have my program running? No, not at all. <coughs> so we are here, sequential prime checker. Okay, takes some time again, 10 millions is not that low number, nine seconds, and first thousand primes are here, thousand prime is 7919, remember it. So my parallel version, first attempt, it's almost the same, except that there's parallel dot for each, whoa, what did I do? dot execute and some anonymous function. Again, I could use a normal function and so on. But this is the same. I'm testing for, for pri primarity and I'm putting the data into output queue. <coughs> so, see now, parallel version 2700, but as you can see, <coughs> We got back some very unordered result, which was to be expected. So as I said before, there's a solution to this. The dot preserve order modifier. In this case, uh, you cannot just, your code cannot just accept an iteration value. It has to produce a result also, so that the wrapper can keep everything in sync. Uh, and the flexibility here is that you can produce one output data or none. So you have an option of not outputting anything. In this case, nothing will happen. Or you can output one value. Uh, you cannot do more than one, sorry. <clears throat> and this result will be then kept in sync with the input order and so on. So again, I have this my output queue. I'm calling parallel dot for each. I told it to preserve the input order. And I told it where I'm writing the output. This is the same queue. I have to do this. And I have this new code which runs in the background it gets an iteration value and produces some data. So if uh, the iteration value is a prime number, I will put it into the output queue. Otherwise, I will not. And the, at the end, this code is completely the same. It reads the first thousand primes and writes them to the output. You can see the execution time is slightly slower because all this processing takes some time. But now you got 7919 again. And the code was running on all eight cores. And as I said, uh, it's perfectly valid to iterate over a string list. Here I have a more complicated example, <coughs> just for fun, to show you what can be done. Uh, so I'm, I'm reading a string list from some file, and I'm running for each over this string list, uh, which is typed as st list of strings. So in my execute, I have here string instead of the omni value. It's all very basic now. For each string in string list, please execute this. Uh, edit value here is the aggregation feature. <coughs> what I did here is I wrote a parallel solution that finds the longest line in the string list. Again, not very practical, but just a demo. So the, for each line in this, this string list, a length is calculated. 
simple. And this is, again, output as some result. <coughs> and then for each value, again, an aggregator function is called, <coughs> which gets this value here and says if it's bigger than currently biggest, currently longest line, please store it back into this. And this one aggregate value is initialized to zero. So I have a value which is initialized to zero and then it gets larger and larger as we find longer and longer lines. Well, of course you could do it here. Uh, the trick with aggregate is that it's not really suitable for such trivial tasks, <coughs> but it's suitable for when you have a, more of a computation here and the uh, actual aggregation of the result is shorter. And why should you use it? Because it will work inside one uh, task and also between more parallel four tasks. So uh, in the beginning, this will run inside one background computation for each result. It will be updated. And then as parallel four background tasks complete their work, this aggregator will be called again to merge partial values from those tasks back into one result. And this result you can get then accessed by calling this whatever was returned here, dot as integer, and you will get the longest line. Okay. Pipeline. This is one of the latest additions, and it turned out to be extremely practical. Many people are already using it. And why? it's good because it allows you to parallelize a code that is inherently sequential and not parallelizable. Parallel 4 is great if you have a problem where you can apply it. But in most cases, uh, parallelization is jo not just a matter of running multiple loops in parallel. It's something more complicated. And to demonstrate this, I have a simple <coughs> scenario here. Let's say you have an application. It reads a file, compresses the data, encrypts the data, and writes the result output. Okay? And the uh, sequential version needs one, four units of time, let's say. Each this takes one unit of time. Okay. And now I'll slowly turn this into parallel program. So each of these parts is basically doing the same. While there's some data, it does something. Reads data, compresses data, encrypts data, and so on. In reality, you usually wouldn't write the program like this. You would write it like this. While there's, there is data, read a block, compress this block, encrypt this block, write this block, and repeat. Because this way, there's much lower memory requirements for the program if you're doing block by block and not a whole file at once. So what you would really do is you would read some data into some buffer. Then you would compress this buffer into another buffer. And then you would encrypt this buffer, another buffer, into a third buffer. And then you would write out the result. If I put this, if I complicate this a little, instead of those buffers, I can put a queue between two points in this program. It's the same, except there can be more than one item in this queue now. I have this still, still single threaded program. It reads data and puts data into first queue. And the second part reads data from the first queue, compresses data and puts it into the second queue and so on and so on as, until we write the data out. And that's it. I can run those as separate tasks now. I can run read, compress, encrypt, write tasks and they are connected only by by those queues. 
we tra transfer data blocks from one, one part of process to the other part. We have a very nice data flow process now. And this stuff can now be executed in much less than four units of time because those tasks now overlap. This one gets the first block, and while it is within the second block, this one can also, all, uh, it can begin on the with the first one, and while it is compressed in the second one, this one can encrypt the first one, and so on and so on. So that's what the pipeline allows you to do. <coughs> you provide it with as many steps or stages, as I call them, and call run at the end. And it will set up those background tasks and queues that are used to transfer data. So you have input queue and intermediary queue and another inter intermediary queue and the output queue where you can get the result back from the pipeline if you want, if your pipeline produces a result. In my example, it was not. It, it just wrote data out, but it's possible. <coughs> And here in the code, I have exactly this same problem solved. Oh, no, I have a slightly simpler, simpler problem. Sorry, there's no compression. I have a stage which reads data from a file. I have a stage which does encryption. Uh, and this is very trivial encryption, just rotates character. And then you, I have the writing stage. And because <coughs> you don't want those uh, intermediary queues to, get, to become too large in one of those tasks is stopped for some time for whichever reason, I can put in a throttle parameter which says if there are more than this number of en entries in the queue, please block the data producer for some time. And then it will start it again. <clears throat> and these stages are very simple. Uh, well, the reader gets input and output, which are blocking collections, as usual. Uh, reads the data line by line. I'm using the plain old Pascal file access here because it returns me nicely line by line. And I wrote this data into the output queue. Then I have the encryptor. This one is written as something called simple stage. If you have a stage which always produces an output for an input, you can forget all about queues and just write a method with, which takes one t-omni value and produces one t-omni value and OmniTrad library will do the looping for you. It just encrypts this, encrypts, this is not a strong encryption, and, and puts the line into the output buffer. And the writer is not using the output, it is just reading the data from the input and writing it out into a file. And that's it. You can forget everything about how this was set up, how the data travels, this is all handled for you. Or, um, it works. If you download the demo and play with it, you, you, have the op you, you can explore it. OK, we are almost at the end. <coughs> I will go very fast through, through the fourth join because it's not, in reality, easy to explain. Uh, so it's useful when your code can produce a SAP computation. For example, in quicksort, you have a computation which says sort the array. It then does the partial sorting by doing the partition, and then it starts two subcomputations for two parts of the array. And those can start two next and two, two next, and those computations, there are more and more on them. In the parallel version, those computations go back into something called computation pool, and they're again processed by those worker threads. Uh, and I will not go into the code deeply. Just show that, uh, where is this? It's called quicksort. 
I have parallel quicksort here. You create a computation, passing it some code, and you create another computation, passing it another code, and then you wait for them to complete. And the difference between this and the future is that here you can have many more computations than there are threads. And they will be, the system will make sure that all threads are always busy and they don't wait and not more than all your cores are busy. So it's complicated, but it makes sure that the stuff is executed as fast as possible and, <coughs> and it doesn't kill your machine while doing this. So, you remember the slide from the beginning? This one? If you use high-level constructs, designing is really not that hard because you know what you have and how to put stuff together. These are just building blocks. And writing is trivial. All the hard work is done for you. Testing is still hard. Multi-threading, if you have a problem, if you have a bug in your background code, you can still have problems finding it and testing stuff. And debugging, okay, debugging is not insane, but it becomes hard. So you still have to care for data sharing. If you access common data, shared data from the background stuff, you will have problems and so on and so on. So not everything is solved for you, but lots of stuff is. So. If you have any question uh, later, just find me. Okay. Uh, he was okay. first. Please. Uh, I see in the previous example, you pass in the omni blocking collection as a omni value a class. Uh, a yes, object. an object. An object. Yes, you can uh, pass an object. I can pass all uh, the, the object. That yes, or any interface, everything. everything. Yes. And, uh, well, you cannot pass a record. That's the only limitation, a record or array or such stuff. And, uh, how can I stop, uh, how can I stop uh, um, a computation when uh, it started if it is uh, very long, long? Uh, um, typically by using a global flag. That's the simplest solution. There's also something called cancellation tokens. So you can pass a cancellation token to the computation and then say, please cancel, but you have to check this in your code, yes. of course, from time to time. Thank you. Okay, maybe you are not the right person to ask my question, but <laughs> if, I, if I can, if I, can um, I ask uh, it to David in this morning, but uh, why Embarcadero don't uh, include this type of stuff? I in don't know. <laughs> ask David, uh, please. Uh, I can only say that I was never contacted by anybody from Embarcadero about these libraries, so I don't know. Okay. <laughs> yes. Yes. I'm not an expert about so nobody is. Don't worry. Yes, this is completely true and it's not solved yet. Uh, if you remember the old times before Delphi 2007, we had this old memory manager which was not really good and when FastMM was included, there was a big performance difference. Uh, something similar happens here. Uh, FastMM has some tricks inside uh, which allows he, it to work faster when there are multiple requests for multiple threads. But basically at some point it will say, stop everybody, 
I have to mark this block as allocated. So if you do lots of allocations, and the tricky part here is that string processing is allocations. If you are concatenating string and such stuff, these are allocations. The memory manager can become a bottleneck. Uh, there are some other memory managers. There's TopMM, which is commercial, works very well in multi-threaded environment, but uses insane amounts, amounts of memory. So it can easily use four times the memory that it's normally used. There's this ScaleMM and SynScaleMM, which are uh, open source, but they're not stable enough for any real work. They crash from time to time. Uh, and all the st other stuff that people have tested, there are some memory allocators from Google and other companies that work in multi-threaded. They all work worse than FastMM. So we have a very good solution at the moment, but it's true that it may block you, yes. <clears throat> so, yes. Okay, thank you for visiting.